that reality is mysterious in a way that the mind does not and will probably never be able to comprehend. And most important for our ex exercise together today is the idea that we have to look at contemplative inquiry even to get a workable organization of thinking to operate effectively in our lives and are already doing so, even though we may not have noticed it and may have been hoping up to now that science could give us a whole answer. We're going to focus today on, on the contemplative inquiry approach. But just to have the, in mind that that's only one of four very important approaches to truth is, is, is helpful. And it's one reality we have on our hands here. There are several approaches. This is kind of discouraging to some people because there are people in the world who think that the scientific approach to truth should give us everything. And it can't give us everything. Because the I is not even considered in this approach to truth. Furthermore, what we learned in the scientific approach to truth is that it's approximate. Of course, our evolution created a mind that does a lot of good in approximating, enough to get us by, uh, but to ever assume that what you possess as a cosmology or as a worldview or as a philosophy of life is the absolute picture of what reality is, is a delusion. The Newtonian, how would we say it, cosmology, Newtonian cosmology has been superseded by New Einsteinian cosmology and, and beyond that, right? So we're always talking about in our cosmology or our scientific overviews uh, something approximate. Our cosmology is not reality, but reality is more mysterious than our cosmology. And this we have learned in contemporary physics. I mean, the Einsteinian universe just opened up new mystery, but then quantum mechanics uh, simply blew the minds out of physicists themselves. Uh, so that physicists have come to say things like this, the more you know about nature, the more you know you don't know. Instead of progressing in science to where we had better knowledge, when you look back, you see all kinds of things we've learned through scientific research, but it didn't make the mystery any less. In fact, it made our experience of the mystery greater, which means probably, very likely, uh, absolutely certainly, for I'm concerned, that the human mind is incapable of possessing absolute knowledge of nature. Let's take an example of the little photon, which is the, the smallest element of light, uh, as well as other things like electrons and protons and atoms. All of these things, these minute things that now define the fundamental particles or pieces or entities of the universe, have found to be in our scientific research manifesting themselves both as waves and particles. So they have two whole systems of mathematics, one for waves and one for particles that are examining the same little old photon. And you know in your mind that a wave is something that goes out through a medium forever, and a particle is something that's happening to something in one little particular space-time moment. How can the same thing be a particle and a wave? Well, it can't be. <laughs> a photon is not a wave, and a photon is not a particle. It just acts kind of like a particle part of the time. And it acts like a wave part of the time. And so what you really have out here in reality is a wavicle <laughs> or something you don't even have a name for. Now this is the state of physics and it brings physicists to their attention uh, that not only is physics approximate <laughs> and, and, and improvable, but it doesn't even give us a consistent picture of what we're looking at here. And these are the foundational parts of reality upon which all reality is constructed. And we don't even have a picture of it. We may not even be able to picture it. 
I don't know if that does anything to your mind, but it sort of blows mine. We have introduced ourselves to a, an approach to truth, which I call contemplative inquiry, where your consciousness, your I, is using a method here. It's a rational method, but it's a method of exploring the I itself, the, the conscious itself, which is a, an approach to reality. A very important approach to reality. All the art creations are using this, consciously or unconsciously. When you write a piece of music, you're putting into expression something about being a being uh, who musics, who rhythms, who vibrates, uh, who has melody, uh, and whatever you might want to say about that. Now, there's another approach to truth equally important, and in fact, we have made more important, which we might call scientific research. And this is consciousness using the method of scientific research to look at not I, not consciousness, but it, some kind of it which is an approach to reality. Now by it, I mean uh, tables and water bottles and other beings. Uh, it might be looking at the brain of some human being with the instruments that can measure what's going on in your brain. But science doesn't look at consciousness. It only looks at manifestations of consciousness like brain vibrations or behaviors of conscious beings, animals and humans. But the process of the approach to truth called scientific research is to look at the its. So if you're a brain researcher, uh, you're, you're, you're interested in what conscious is going on in the person whose brain you're looking at. But if you want to know, you have to what? Ask that person. <laughs> who's the brain owner, what they're feeling. And then you can see if that particular feeling or state of consciousness corresponds to the electrical instruments that you're using to observe brain waves and so forth. This contemplative inquiry is an approach to truth about reality. And this scientific research is an approach to truth about reality. And it's the same reality that's being approached. But contemplative inquiry can't see scientific research approach. And the scientific research can't see the contemplative inquiry approach because it's only dealing with its. It's not looking at consciousness. It is part of the motif of science to not be subjective, but to be objective. And consciousness is not an object. Consciousness is only experienced directly by your conscious being looking at your consciousness. So the scientist is not studying consciousness ever. Only reports of consciousness, behaviors of conscious beings, but conscious itself, in order to even understand what you mean by the word, has to use this other approach to truth. A psychologist has to sort of straddle these two approaches to truth because you don't know anything about your psyche without looking inside to see a psyche. Uh, and so there are behavioral psychologists who emphasize behaviors and reports uh, as a clue to understanding everything about uh, your psyche, which is of course not possible actually because they have to correspond to what they can experience inwardly. And then there are depth psychologists who emphasize the contemplative inquiry pole for understanding the psyche, even though they would also have the scientific look at your brain and your behavior as part of their reference in elaborating their psychology. Now this approach to truth ideas I learned from Ken Wilbur, and he has 
two other approaches to truth, both of which he calls the, the we approach. And the we approach has two subcategories. Approach to intimacy and the approach to commonality. These are my words, not his, but I think that's what he means. By intimacy, I mean the kind of thing that goes on when one eye confronts another eye. <laughs> uh, you're you're doing a experience of reality that's very different from simply looking inside your own consciousness. You're sharing consciousness. Uh, there's connection on an intellectual level, but there's also connection on an emotional level, on a sensory level, uh, maybe on a sexual level. Intimacy is a dynamic of reality discovery uh, that is bringing some of the it and some of the I together into an experience of one-to-one. -one. Of course, it may happen in a group larger than one, but intimacy is a, a we approach to truth. We are a we being. Uh, we have our being in relations to other people. Commonality is a little different than intimacy. Commonality are the social patterns and structures and processes that you use to have society as a human family. So the English language, for example, is one of our commonalities. Uh, having the English language together allows us to elaborate our intimacy and our thinking and so forth together as a group. There are other commonalities, such as educational structures and, and uh, political structures and economic structures. All these commonalities are pulled together by humanity to be an, an approach to truth. If you want to talk about justice or social revolution or repair of society, uh, you have pulled together things you've learned from the scientific approach to truth and things you've learned from the I approach to truth into proposals of workability for society. And this fact of workability, that this works, that this enables, that this has usefulness is the test of truth. You are a human being, and as a human being, we can together define profound humanness that we have in common. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to do with this category of consciousness and being is identify looking inside ourselves to see what makes us human uh, in a universal sense. So I am assuming that all of you and all other human beings on the planet are capable of consciousness, of consciousness in the same way that I am. Now that can be wrong maybe, but that, that's been my experience so far is that I haven't met a human being who isn't capable of, of being conscious. You could assume from what you actually experience that I'm the only conscious being in the universe. The rest of you are just robots. But I'm, I'm conscious, I'm unique, I'm the only one that has this kind of inner experience. But uh, that's a very radical hypothesis of which there is no evidence. <laughs> well, I think you're in one sense born conscious, that the fetus before it's born is conscious. It's, it's elemental to your creation. It's, it's, it's just different. Just as there as toes are there and eyes are there, and it's something that's developing. Uh, uh, and then it has tools like the, the mind and, and what the mind takes in and, and systematizes. And so your, your capacity for realizing and living your consciousness grows, but uh, it doesn't, it's not something you have to create or, or, or you know, it's, it's, it's given. We're all on a journey. Obviously, we're not the same set of awarenesses that we had as a two-year-old. We, we have some big changes in our lives where we become more conscious or more capable of accessing consciousness and living out of it than we had in an earlier stage, and that never ends. I mean, your, your journey goes on uh, from birth to death, uh, but this is a, a 
how would you say it, a sanctification of your being uh, that you're capable of through the experiences that you're having. When you're with people, maybe a whole group of people like this sometimes, who are aware of and discovering their being or new aspects of their being, you, you know there's a synchronicity, a uh, connection going on at an extremely deep level. As a matter of fact, when you talk about finding a partner who's a soulmate, uh, that's what you're looking for, somebody who not only makes an emotional connection and a sexual connection, but a, a being connection, <laughs> chi to chi. Huh? Uh, and you know when that's happening, if you're able to be sensitive to your being, uh, you know that that person is coming from the same place or a similar place, and that we have a fellowship going on here that has to do with profound humanness and not just our last best ideas about it. That's why we need more than one being in our life is because <laughs> just being married to one person doesn't fulfill all of your needs for connection. Uh, uh, I mean, almost every wife needs other women in their life besides men, her man, because women just have some sensitivities that males have more trouble having. <laughs> and so you, you need a wide spectrum of human beings to satisfy your need for connection. Our old picture, and we all have to have pictures of things, was a double deck picture. Heaven and earth, and in terms of the individual person that you are, soul and body. And this old picture it, it sort of symbolized a kind of unbelievable separation between two realms of being. And somehow the soul was a part of enigmas of a sort that were on another level than, than body. Body had to do with your participation in it, so to speak, and soul had to do with your participation in, in your I reality, in some sense. And we sometimes use the word mind for this. Mind meaning everything that went on inside your being. Uh, we sometimes use the word consciousness. We sometimes use the word will. Anyway, there's great arguments that have gone on between the importance of mind over will or will over mind and so forth. <laughs> or mind over body and uh, body relation to mind. And uh, This has been our, our picture for thinking about these things. Now what we're discovering, or I think, in our time is that will is an aspect of consciousness. Consciousness is not only taking in reality, but it's putting forth. And will is that dynamic of consciousness that is enacting something in the world. So it's consciousness that's doing your doing. And consciousness is also doing your, your taking in or, or being at attention to things. And we're using the mind to take in uh, uh, us, our consciousness of things. We're also using the mind to work out our putting forth uh, things. So consciousness has become a category different than mind, and will has become a category that is a part of consciousness. Now let me draw another picture, which is a more adequate picture, the holding how these things might be understood better by us in our strange time. Consciousness is like a, a center inside us, I don't know where inside us, whether it's inside our toes or our heart or our head, but somehow inside us there's a centering, because we can look in there and see consciousness centered. Uh, we look at, see ourselves centeredly looking at our center. Uh, and then this consciousness that's center is surrounded by interior functionings, the mind. Now, perhaps the mind is the same thing as the brain, but the mind is seeing the brain from the inside. You see that? The brain is seeing the mind from the outside. And it's a very different experience to look at somebody's brain and see all the electrical and chemical stuff going on, even though you know that's their mind, if, they, if they're looking at it from the inside. And it's kind of fun to 
have somebody look, look at things and, and have somebody else look at them from outside here. But anyway, it's the experience of a brain is exterior <coughs> to the inner person. And the experience of the mind is the interior experience of consciousness of your brain. Also, the body as a whole out here is an experience of the world. But interiorly, what we're experiencing is feelings. I'm going to put the word toe here because there are feelings in our toe. <laughs> your whole body has feelings. When you move your muscles, you can feel those movements of muscle from the inside. Some of the chemical uh, inside activity you can feel with your consciousness. Uh, like you have a indigestion or something, you can certainly feel that. Uh, you can feel pain, you can feel pleasure, and so forth. There are all kinds of feelings. Emotional feelings are very complex inside feelings that have to do with how you're relating as a consciousness to the whole of your experience. And then there are very subtle kind of feelings like light and vibrations of sound and taste and uh, smell and so forth. Uh, so interiorly you have feelings that are somehow related to your body and you have thoughts uh, that are somehow related to your brain and total nervous system. And then there is an outside again of your particular body and its interior going on this is uh, there is the there is the world around you uh, and then there is this something else going on and that is the fact that consciousness is centered in you but it's it's also like a a I don't know what, a pattern of wave that surrounds you. There's a subtle vibration of things going on around your body uh, in this uh, world around you. What I mean by emotions is something coming from the body somewhere uh, that is registering the quality of our conscious experience of reality. So consciousness and reality are both contributing. I mean, if a truck runs over your toe, you have emotions about that. <laughs> uh, if somebody is scaring you to death, you have fear emotion. Uh, if there's some challenges, uh, you have angry emotion. But, so uh, all your emotions are registering reality is confronting you, and also whoever you are. If, if you're uh, this kind of person, and and, and the reality is challenging that kind of person, you have an emotion that is both telling you who you are and what you're facing. Anyway, emotion is a great capacity had even by cats and dogs and all the mammalian species. All the mammalian species have strong emotional feelings. And those emotional feelings help you make good decisions about reality. If you had part of your brain destroyed and no longer capable of emotions, you would be very much handicapped in, in making decisions. But emotions, or that kind of a feeling that's a very sophisticated part of your brain and a very sophisticated part of your life. While those other feelings that you mentioned, like, like uh, sensory feelings and feeling your emotions and, and feeling pain and so forth, uh, those are more ancient in your evolution. Your sexual feelings go way back to the reptilian uh, part of your evolution and, and, and way on back even further, I think, than your amoebas felt uh, pain and pleasure and so forth. So feelings is an enormous topic. Emotions are a highly developed form of feeling uh, had only by the mammalian species in, in, in full intensity. It may be a little bit of mammalian, a little bit of feeling, emotional feeling in reptiles, but it's minimal. Your reptiles just cannot be the same kind of pet as your dogs and cats because they just do not have that emotional quality that allows that kind of emotional connection with you. Well, the dog or cat will snuggle up to you as just a very important part of their life, and so on. The truth of which is to be tested out in your own life by looking with your own consciousness inside your own body and seeing if what you name 
as emotions are not that kind of signal as to who I am in thinking about what and what I'm facing and how I, the, the relationship is, is registering to me. Now, say a little bit more about consciousness itself. It is a attentionality and an intentionality. Attentionality means paying attention, uh, taking in. Your consciousness takes in things. Uh, it pays attention to things. In that sense, knows things. So, attentionality has to do with the knowing aspect of being conscious. Intentionality has to do with the doing aspect of being conscious. And you use the mind to do your doings, but it's consciousness that's doing. When you say, raise my arm, consciousness did that. The muscles helped, but the muscles just did what they were told. It's not that there's some physical form that's raising my arm, really, although physical forms are used, of course, and the mind is used. But raise my arm, it's a command conscience is giving to my arm going up. And everything you do is originating in this mysterious consciousness, using your mind, using the muscles to do it. Your being includes attentionality to the world around you and intentionality to doing something in the world around you. So being is just the depth beneath this polarity of knowing and doing. Uh, but it's very different to operate out of your being and your doing than just simply uh, operating out of your last best idea. You see, if you're going from ideas to doing, you're living shallowly compared to going from being to doing. You know, your sports figure, especially basketball, bas that was my favorite sport. There's a time in playing basketball when you get in these zones. You just can't miss the basket. No matter what you do, your body, your being, if you like, knows how to shoot that ball. And it just goes in. And when you're in that zone, other basketball players that are good know that, God, that player's in a zone. Uh, we got to interrupt that. <laughs> We're going to get beat here. Uh, well, that's a weird experience to have to feel yourself acting out of your being instead of acting out of your, I should make this shot, I missed the last shot, and I, 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 I need to make this one, and so on, you know. And, and if you're running a business, or if you're uh, giving a talk like this, there's a difference between operating out of your being in relation to other beings who are operating out, and operating out of things I've assembled in my silly mind only. Well, e ego is something you've invented. You see, your ego is a construction you put together to kind of approximate who you are. Uh, so it is, there, there are different signals. Yeah, there are different signals coming from my approximations and my actual reality. So uh, a lot of what comes from my approximations doesn't work out. And so living from your ego runs into challenges that uh, clue you that you're living out of self-constructed delusions. But, but when you're acting out of your being, you're sort of in, invincible. Uh, that is, there's nothing that can stop you from acting out of your being. Uh, death itself doesn't seem to stop you. You can act out of your being right through the whole experience of dying. And the same is true with knowing. Your mind doesn't know anything. Your mind knows nothing. It's consciousness that knows using the great facilities of the mind. This is not a depreciation of the mind. The mind is a computer of amazing capability. I mean, some of the artificial intelligence we've created with our computers is, are amazing, but they really just speed up certain little things that the human mind can do. And there's a lot of other things that the human mind can do that the best computer cannot do. As a matter of fact, the 
consciousness of a cat is way beyond what any computer, however powerful, can do. This is the amazing thing about consciousness. Of course, the computers are very helpful in extending the capacity of our mind into things. But the knower, the attentionality factor in your consciousness is your consciousness. And, and this uh, in, intentionality. Now, how is conscious related to the mind? We've always talk, talked that, but just to get started, it, just as conscious is not the brain, conscious is not your toes, and it's not your brain, uh, it's not your mind, it's not your feelings, it's something deeper than toes, feelings, mind, and brain. And as we observe other animals, we can see that they're conscious. Not in the same way we're conscious, but they don't have the same minds we have, but we know our cats are conscious. We know our dog friends are conscious. Uh, I mean, they don't have to have words to be conscious. They don't have to have sentences and paragraphs to be conscious. They don't even have to have dance and music and, and other art forms to be conscious. Uh, my cat knows that when she scratches on the door, that means let me in and she knows exactly where her food bowl is, and she knows how to get there from her memory without any need whatsoever of language. Now, we also have that kind of consciousness, that kind of consciousness that uses, I call it, uh, multisensory reruns, that in our brain, uh, everything we've experienced can just rerun at, at the moment's attention. When you, you see something, to interpret that something, our brain reruns every experience that we've ever had in that area to interpret it and help us understand what's happening. Uh, so a cat has a great, well-organized intersensory rerun. You're thinking of your dog. Uh, your dog has a smell rerun that you don't have. <laughs> it's amazing the kind of intelligence dogs have about smelling. A world of sense. They can find trap human beings in the snow drifts that we would never smell in a hundred years because we don't have that particular sense developed the way they do. They live in a smell world that we don't even understand, but we live in a similar kind of inter multisensory reruns. They have five different senses, some people, as they said, and all five of these immediately go into multisensory reruns. I mean, the mind is, is very sensitive to the signals that are coming in. And we have, as human beings, at least five. Amoeba has a couple. Uh, but those sensory inputs come in, and the mind of the amoeba or the mind of the human puts those into reruns that you can use to anticipate the future better. Uh, so so it, thinking and those sensory feelings are very closely related. And, and, and if, if your thinking is not pretty much related to what you're sensing, you're not going to survive or not going to live very effectively, right? Your consciousness of things is always ahead of your mind. Uh, thinking about it, especially consistently you know, and well-ordered fashion, is a, is a reflection that comes after your consciousness is already conscious of it. So what an intuition tends to be is your conscious speaking to you beyond what your mind knows at the moment. Uh, so you're always sensitive, you're always having knowing experiences going on that are far greater uh, than what you've thought through, right? And sometimes you wake up in the morning having dreamed about something with your consciousness that your mind is surprised to know <laughs> as you begin to understand it. Uh, so intuition is just, to me, it's just a very normal kind of thing of experiencing consciousness ahead of your mind. We also have that level of consciousness that the dog and cat and other animals have. Uh, but we have something in addition. We have a mind, a brain in addition to these other species of mammals that we're so familiar with. We have, we have words. We have symbols. And symbols are something different than multisensory reruns. Symbols stand for whole groups of multisensory re reruns. Take the, take the symbol four. A cat just doesn't have four. Four cats, four food bowls, four clouds, four, you know, 
doesn't have that capacity to use the word four, or that two plus two equal four, all that's missing in the cat's intelligence. But it's not missing in our intelligence. Even a young child, just a year old, is unbelievable capacity for symbol using, for language, for art, for music, and all kinds of things of that nature. So and obviously, our consciousness is, given, is being given tools that uh, other species in the, just do not have, or just don't have it developed in that, to that extent. It may be that there are uh, certain chimpanzees and porpoises or, who are on the edge of springing <laughs> into symbol using. Uh, they say elephants celebrate their dead by standing and circling their, their trunks. Maybe that's a beginning. We have a, a development of consciousness. It's as if evolution has, that consciousness is a, this something in the universe that has a propensity to become more conscious. And that's an interesting way of looking at our evolution. And we begin with conscious amoebas back here, conscious singular cell animals that are conscious. They take in reality. They make some decision about it. They do something to go get their food, to get away from danger. So every time you see something alive, it's conscious to some degree. And what makes it alive is its consciousness. And when it's killed, it's no longer conscious. And this consciousness wishes to become more conscious. And in our amazing bodies, minds, persons, that consciousness takes on a, a substance, takes on a reality that's absolutely astonishing in its capacities to be conscious, to be conscious of consciousness itself and to ask itself, what in the hell is consciousness? <laughs> And, and what in the hell is this reality about which I am conscious? I think there, there, there is a way in which we sort of know when we're really off track. And uh, despair is one of the clues. Uh, that the, you're just bored with life. You're bored with life. Well. You know, life is not boring. It's, it's actually, it's this, if you're aware of it, it's incredibly demanding and, 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 and exciting. Uh, and it's, to have the opportunity to be a human being is, is wondrous beyond belief, even if you have no legs and no arms. <laughs> you're still a wondrous being. And what we call sin and malice and bondage and despair, <laughs> These are all malfunctions in being your being. They're, they have attitude toward understanding things. Uh, misunderstandings come out of your despairs and, and malices and so forth. But the essence of sin, or in such words as that in our heritage, do not mean simply misunderstandings. They mean not being your being which works into misunderstandings, works into bad actions as well. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth and said of it, all it is is good. So in the beginning, you're good. But it took us about 20 minutes, I think, to begin the evil <laughs> creation perversions. And, and so we're all uh, now experiencing original sin, if you like. We're all experiencing <laughs> mis misperceptions and, and mistakes about the way life is. Well. The things happen to you that help you recognize your dysfunction. And of course, giving it up, giving up the dysfunction, restores you to a certain degree to your, your consciousness. Then you have to decide. For part of what consciousness is, is intentionality. It's deciding to have this consciousness and this world that you're conscious of as your life, which is a very courageous thing to do. When you think about the world we have to live in today, I mean, when I think about the United States of America and the Congress of the United States of America, I think maybe we should move to Sweden. <laughs> but I'm living here. This is my own nation. This is my world uh, to be a part of this particular society and so forth, to be conscious of the despairs and predicaments and horrors of my nation is my life. And, and it takes courage to be a part of that 
and courage to be as helpful as I can to other human beings to experience that and correct it, and so forth. Uh, so it is a kind of a mystery how it is that we grow up. Uh, but I think this is the stages that I've experienced as I become aware of the dysfunctions. I become aware of the great gift of, of consciousness to me as a human being. And I have to decide it, accept it, and, and, and intentionally live it. Uh, and that then puts me in a better place to take in the next crisis <laughs> and, and the next collapse of some dysfunction and the acceptance and the acceptance of that. And the, so something like that. The Chinese have some exercises called Qigong and Tai Chi. Maybe some of you are familiar with it. I mean, one of the great exercises of the, both of those disciplines is gathering and sinking the chi. And if you, it's a feeling you are gathering something when you gather and that you are feeding your original mouth something you've gathered. This is the Chinese insight. You ask them, what is qi that you're gathering and, and centering here? What, what is this qi? And they say, oh, it's an energy. Why don't we just sort of guess that the energy they're gathering and feeding is consciousness? That sort of gives us a picture of consciousness we may not have. Let me illustrate this. Close your eyes and hold your hand up, your right hand up. And tell me when you feel something. Yeah. Okay. We didn't have cheek to cheek, but we had chi to chi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that may seem like a little teensy proof of this mysterious fact that consciousness is like a wave that goes out to the stars, very intense right close by, and extremely intense in this center. And everybody is such a mysterious being. And beneath your knowing and doing is of course something called being. Now being your being doesn't even take your mind. Being your being is in a way like doing nothing. Uh, it's, it's your consciousness being your consciousness. It's your consciousness surrendering to being the consciousness that you are. And so this kind of experience of infinite silence, as we sometimes call it in meditation, is an experience of your consciousness being itself uh, in the context of being the whole part of the wholeness of being uh, that your consciousness is being. Well, there's something very similar about you and me as, as human beings. Of course, your specific history and, and specific biology and genetics and so forth is all unique. Uh, but I'm using the category being as something we have in common. Uh, and it's our consciousness is our being in the arena of being conscious of the consciousness itself and of all of its struggling. So wherever your consciousness is struggling, that's your being. And to be conscious of that being, it's not just ideas in your head that you're conscious of although those were possibly reflecting your, your being, but your being is a deeper experience. Your consciousness, being conscious of your consciousness, and the mind can begin working with it, but it's not the mind you're, you are when you're conscious of your consciousness. You become more conscious and more conscious of your consciousness, and, and your consciousness changes at every minute of your life, and you become more mature at living from your consciousness and all that kind of thing. Uh, but your consciousness is very similar to my consciousness, and it's something created by your creator. It's not something you invented. Uh, being a conscious being is one of the miracles of your existence uh, to which you had nothing whatsoever to do. And you're a member of a species that is conscious in the way that you can be conscious. Uh, it's very different from other species. Joe Matthews, some of you know, some of you don't. 
But my main mentor in life and the founder of the religious order that some of us here belong to at one time, he talked about great thanks, let's call it GT, that means great think, great feel, and great resolve. You can see the knowing, being, doing structure here. <laughs> uh, great thinks is something that your mind participates in. Great feel is something your, I don't know what, your deep being participates in. And the great resolve is your intentionality. You're taking that in and living it. Pole of the all experience. So all is great think, or can be accessed through great things that go with it, great feels, and great resolves. Uh, now we built, or Matthews built, or some of us are helping Matthews build, a whole bunch of charts uh, on states of being with different great things and great feels and great resolves. Uh, just an amazing contemplative inquiry into the whole wonder of, of, of all. But let me illustrate the great think image. And I want you to try to come up with what is the great feel that goes with these great things? And what is the great resolve that goes with these great things? Life and death are two wings on the same bird. Death walks with us every day of our living. As Carlos Castaneda suggests, death walks behind us just over our left shoulder, if we turn our head quickly, we might see death walking there. Anyhow, you get a certain sense of what we're talking about here with these three categories, uh, that any particular great thing that leads you into a state of awe has with it some feeling, some deep feeling, and has with it the necessity to resolve in order even to experience this, uh, this happening. Well, I'm gonna take us a little further into this and read a poem when the Matthews and company created these charts of, of, um, of the, all the states of being of all there are, <laughs> in principle. Of course, any chart is incomplete, but, uh, but anyway, that was the idea. What are all the states of all? And we came up with that in one sentence, if you'll believe it. We live in a land of mystery that contains a flowing river of consciousness, a huge mountain of care, and a wild sea of tranquility. Those Four categories uh, can be used, we said, to symbolize, or at least to organize, all the many states of awe that human beings are experiencing. We live in a land of mystery. We know nothing about it. We don't know where we've come from. We don't know where we're going. We don't know where we are. We are newborn babes. We have never been here before. We will never see it again. This moment is fresh, unexpected, surprising. As this moment moves into the past, it cannot be fully remembered. All memory is a creation of our minds, and our minds cannot fathom the land of mystery, much less remember it. We experience mystery now, and only now, any previous now is gone forever. Any yet to be now is not yet born. We live now, only now, in a land of mystery. It is true that when you think you, think you have to know everything, that's kind of upsetting <laughs> because you know you don't and know you never will. And so to really give up and live in a land of mystery might be calming, yeah. Let's look at the river of consciousness. I'll read this one and we'll try our, our sensibilities of feeling and resolving on it. Within the land of mystery flows a river of consciousness or freedom. Consciousness is a moisture in the desert of things, an enigma in the land of mystery. Consciousness flows through body and mind, our bodies are pain and pleasure, desire, emotion, stillness, and passion. All these are but rocks in the water on the banks of the river of consciousness. 
Consciousness is not the body, but a flow through the body and with the body. Consciousness is an alertness that is also a freedom to intend, to will, to do. The mind is a tool of consciousness, providing consciousness with the ability to reflect upon consciousness itself. But consciousness cannot be contained within the images and symbols of the mind. Consciousness is an enigma that mind cannot comprehend. Even noticing consciousness is an act of consciousness using the mind and flowing like a river in the land of mystery. That's what awe is like. It is thoughts that the mind uses to kind of get a hold of it, and then it is a genuine deep feeling, and it is a decision. Within the land of mystery rises a mountain of care. Care for self, care for others, care for earth, care for the cosmos, care that we exist, care that we suffer, care that we may find rest and fulfillment, care that we may experience our caring and not grow numb and dead. It takes no effort to care. It takes effort not to care. Care is given with the land of mystery. Care is part of the mystery of being. We care. We just care. We are made of care. Care is a mountain because care is so huge, so challenging to embrace, to climb, to live. Care is a demand upon us that is more humbling, more consuming, more humiliating than all the authorities and laws and obligations of our social existence. Care is a forced march into the dangers and the hard work of constructing a life that is not a passive vegetable growth, nor a wildly aggressive obsession. Care is an inescapable given simply there, yet care is also an assertion of our very being. It is compassion, devotion, love for all that is given and for all parts of every given thing and being. Like Atlas, we lift the planet day by day, year by year, love without end in the land of mystery. The Sea of Tranquility. In the land of mystery, there is a sea of tranquility, a place of rest amidst the wild waters of life. The waves may be high, our small boat tossed about, but there we are with a courageous heart. It is our heart that is courageous. We are born with this heart. We do not achieve it. We can simply rest within our own living heart, our own courageous heart that opens vulnerably to every person and all the aspects of that person, to our own self and to every aspect of that self, to life as a whole, with all its terrors and joys, this is a strange rest, for no storm can end it, no challenge of life defeat it, no loss, no death, no horror of being, no fear can touch our courageous heart. We live, if we allow ourselves to truly live, on this wild sea of everything, in the tranquility of our own indestructible, courageous heart. To manifest and fully experience this tranquility, we only have to give up the creations of our mind that we have substituted for this ever-present peace. We have only to open to the land of mystery, flowing in a river of consciousness, containing a mountain of care. Here and here alone do we find the sea of tranquility. Here in the land of mystery, that our mind cannot comprehend, create, or control, here beyond our deepest depth or control is a sea of tranquility in the land of mystery. So that's what we're going to try to do in this session is talk a little bit about wonder, dread, but also fascination. I mean, you, you're driving down the road, 
and you experience an auto accident. It's a, it's a dreadful experience. Maybe somebody's dying, maybe somebody's badly injured, ambulances are coming, police are coming, so forth. But it's also fascinating. You may not be able to take your eyes <laughs> off of that event that's happening there before you. Uh, a funeral is dreadful, but it's also fascinating. In fact, you're there because, for one reason, you're there, maybe to celebrate the life that's just completed, but you're there also because death itself is fascinating, because relating to death is a fascinating problem. Uh, so gathering to ritualize the passing of a member of your group or life is both dreadful and fascinating. And then the third part of awe or wonder is courage. The courage to experience the intensity of dread. The courage to experience the intensity of fascination. So whenever life confronts you with dread and fascination, some kind of combination, it's confronting you with the courage to have that intensity and live it. And if all three of those things are there, you're in awe. Ancient sages of the Orient found paths beyond the, the yang of thought and the yin of feeling into the way of wonder. In Sabasia, Hindu and Buddhist seers found methods of concentrating, of concentration that opened enlightenment beyond binding thought, joy beyond relative feelings, reactive feelings, and liberation beyond failed compulsions. In the West, great minds focused on great thoughts that carried consciousness beyond the customs of foolishness into experiences of great feels and great resolves that together with the great thoughts witnessed to a landscape of wonder. Wonder is another word for awe and the numinous. Wonder lights up thought with new vigor. Wonder cleans feelings of their exaggerated sentiment. Wonder interprets compulsive behaviors and restores us to the paths of freedom, effectiveness, and persistence. Wonder is a hard experience to talk about, but that has not prevented every era of humans from trying. Being yourself is not so easy because you don't know what yourself is, but here's nine different things you, <laughs> the I am is, uh, or, or you are. And this is a, a model of this same content that we just went over with the uh, land of mystery. These are another way of breaking down or organizing uh, these uh, states of all, uh, these states of spirit, or I like to call it profound humanness. This is, this is your profound level of being human. And uh, as you can see, the structure of this chart, uh, structures between intentionality on the one's left-hand side and intentionality on the right-hand side. This is your knowing side of the chart, those, first, those three states of being over there. And then there's the doing side of the chart uh, on, the, on, the, on the right, uh, the three on the right. The three in the middle are the being states of all. And then the chart, top and bottom, relates to solitariness. The three on the bottom are more related to your solitary existence, the states of being more related to your solitary existence. And the top three are more related to your life with others, uh, the, the, the togetherness aspect of, of profound humanness. Uh, enchantment with being, uh, the love of reality, joyous stillness, uh, enchantment is a very helpful word for this state of being. Uh, maybe you've been enchanted at various times in your life with various things, like, you know, the first lover that you really resonated with uh, was perhaps an enchanting experience. Uh, or perhaps you've found a community of people somewhere that was really enchanting, or a period in your life that was enchanting, uh, uh, or, or work relationship that was, well, this is it, you know, th this is enchanting. So we have a lot of juice cen centered around the word enchanting uh, as some of those really great moments uh, uh, of our living. 
To be enchanted with being is to be enchanted with literally everything, the ups and the downs of life. And enchanted is just such a powerful thing. That, that's, that's the most, to be enchanted with being is the most intense kind of enchantment. To be enchanted with being is enchantment beyond enchantment. Uh, that's a, the kind of thing, it's kind of a glow added to everything. It's, it's a kind of a brilliancy sort of added to everything. Uh, enchantment with being is intensification. But it's not necessarily emotionally ecstatic. Uh, enchantment with being can be very quiet, more subtle, uh, joyous stillness. It can be rest. It can be just a glow to everything. Outflowing compassion. We've so sentimentalized the love of others that it takes a little harshness almost to get this one really understood. Uh, for example, loving our own children is a challenge. Let's, uh, let's just admit it, it's a challenge. I had four and my current wife had two, so we have six human beings to keep up with as children. Or they're no longer children, any of them, but we keep up with them anyway as adults in our life now, but still, we're related to them in a very special way. And when you have six people like that to relate to, not selected by you, <laughs> exactly, although you're responsible for them being here, but still, uh, they're a surprise. And out of six, one of them is going to fall far from the tree, as they say. <laughs> and they're just not going to fill any kind of expectation you could have possibly come up with. And they're not going to be a, uh, what, what you call it, a reproduction of you. <laughs> they're going to fall far from the trees. I have a person in my neighborhood that I, I kind of like. I mean, he, he talks to us when we walk around the block. He, he's with a member of our little block club that got the county commissioner to repair our road. But he is a Southern Baptist of the worst sort. <laughs> and he gives me a sermon I can't quite accept on every walk I meet him with. <laughs> One of his most recent sermons was that uh, he thought the whole problem of the world was that women were no longer in the home. <laughs> that the last thing children should see as they leave in the morning was their mother at the door waving goodbye. And the first thing they should see when they come home is their mother waving hello. That that is the way, the, if the world were like that, all the problems would be solved. At the time, I didn't have the presence of mind to respond as I thought of later, but I wish now I had, though I don't know how I would have taken it, if I just said, well, my solution is that we ought to have the men occupy the home because they're making such a mess of the world and, <laughs> and let the women run it for a while. <laughs> but anyhow, you get the idea. The people on your block are, are not going to be easy to love. Uh, and my nation. Let's move to Sweden, okay? Humanity as a whole. Why we can't deal with the most obvious challenges of global warming and climate catastrophe and aristocratic nonsense and dictatorship and ungrueling poverty. We just can't get our stuff together to make decent responses to those things. So loving humanity is a demand. And that's what we're after here. To feel this state of being is just opening to this kind of demand. We got a little bit of a feel of that in the Mountain of Care a while ago. Opening this field, opening yourself to the demand of others in your life for a really creative responding. Cousin Zakas held this for me with this little sentence that uh, scared me to death and, and yet loved me to death for all my life after I heard it. He says, love responsibility. Say, it is my duty and mine alone to save the earth. If it is not saved, then I alone am to blame. That state of being really gets me, I'll tell you. Uh, I can't possibly do everything, but I need to live in that acceptance of the demand. I'm to blame. I am responsible. 
for everything. Okay, that's outflowing compassion. Don't forget it. All right, <clears throat> down here in the lower right hand corner is primal merging beyond egoism, persistent initiative. Uh, beyond egoism means being beyond who you think you are. Uh, and uh, the personality patterns that you customarily live out of. Uh, for example, I showed up at age 16 or so as a very shy person. That may not seem obvious to you this morning, but I was a wallflower. Dating girls was like stepping off a cliff into the ocean. Uh, and getting off the side of the room and dancing with somebody was a huge challenge. And I was just a mathematician, you know, off here in the clouds of abstract thought and interesting ideas and a physicist and you know, I was a nerd. <laughs> and being a, a shy person seemed like just automatic. I mean, what else could you be? If you're shy, you're shy, right? No, that is not who I am. That is not who you are if you're shy. Uh, this shy personality can be transcended to a degree that's astonishing. Or maybe you're an angry person as your personality type. You just are in a small rage about everything most of the time, a uh, raging bull in, in life's going on. <laughs> well, that's not who you are. Uh, you can transcend raging bull. Uh, you're more than that. Or maybe you're just uh, boisterous as your personality type. Uh, no, you can calm that down for whatever situation you need to. So anyway, what I'm talking about, primal merging is finding your place in your freedom to be more than the customary ego and personality that is habitually uh, discharacterizing your existence. So it's merging with that freedom. It's merging with that capacity to be more than you think you are. To some sense, accomplishing less than you think you can. But mostly, most of us are depreciating the greatness of being a human being. So mostly, uh, primal merging means merging with the greatness that you're neglecting and not letting loose in, in this world. Inherent purity, beyond good and evil, audacious boldness, uh, I am an uncaused, unauthorized, unprecedented set of options and creative response to everything. Uh, the Adam and Eve myth is a great story about this state of being. The, the, the tree off of which Adam and Eve ate is called the knowledge of good and evil, right? It wasn't, the, wasn't knowledge they were not to eat. It was the knowledge of good and evil that they were to know what was the right thing to do and what was the wrong thing to do, and to be certain about what they were doing. That was the temptation. And it looked good to eat. It looks good to eat to us, actually, doesn't it? To know what the right thing to do is, absolutely. To know what the wrong thing to do is, absolutely. And to feel certain about everything you do. Pretty tasty. <laughs> so <laughs> eating off that tree is the beginning of our problems according to that story. Uh, uh, the devil said it was good to eat, but uh, God said this is forbidden. And it's still forbidden. Every decision you make is an ambiguous decision uh, in which you do not know what's the perfectly right thing to do or the perfectly wrong thing to do. You just know you're there with your august freedom. And strangely enough, inherent purity is being that freedom, accepting the fact that you can act without certainty that you can just risk and risk again and risk again a decision in the midst of totally confusing, ambiguous, challenging, unbelievable circumstances and, and be in that sense pure to your deep freedom. That audacious boldness, uh, even though you don't know what to do, you do something. Uh, I give the illustration of my divorce of my first wife and marriage of the second. That was an incredibly difficult transition because the religious order I belonged to didn't approve of my divorce. Uh, and I had to take into view the fact that that was a big thing to me because these were the best friends in my whole life and the only vocation that mounted anything to me. But I was being confronted with the decision of leaving that great vocation 
in order to straighten out my marital relationships or leaving my marriage the way it was, which was not what I wanted for the rest of my life, in order to be a part of this order. And there was no right answer, or there was two right answers, or there's two wrong answers, I don't know what it was, but at any rate, you get, may get a little bit the feel of being confronted with, with those kinds of decisions in your life. And uh, living beyond good and evil, doing audaciously bold things, uh, is an access of your inherent purity, your authenticity, your profound humanness. The last one up there is a tin, a tune working. Rape is not a tune working. Love making might be a tune working. So you've got to get that as a symbol in your mind there. Being sure of acting out rigid dogma and pushing your liberal ideologies on life uh, is not a tune working. Contextual ethics is a good symbol for what a tune working means. It means letting in the real reality you're having to deal with and understanding as best you can and then making some decisions that are uh, attuned to the reality you're living with, uh, the people you're living with, the, the world situation you're living with. Uh, I love a piece of scripture that is put in the mouth of Jesus by the gospel writer of John. Uh, it goes like this. My father's working and I am working. This is you know, a symbol of the authentic person saying this. The, the final mystery is working here and I am working in attunement with the working of this final mystery. That's what I mean by attuned working. And it means being beyond fate. That is, people say that global warming cannot be solved. They're just going to give into it and sail to their doom as best they can. <laughs> no. It's living beyond fate. There is no final answers to how things can, can outcome. Uh, I can be attuned to the possibilities in my situation in a way that the world around me is refusing to acknowledge. And it means obedient implementation. Uh, it's strange to talk about obedience as a part of freedom. But that's this kind of obedient implementation of attuned working in the situation you have on your hands is freedom. It's the creative end of freedom uh, to create life and to create life in my times. It's not being your being that creates uh, misaction. Well, that mystery of experience yourself as a knowing and a doing and a being beneath even the knowing and the doing is almost a crucial clue to what consciousness is. This is built on a tradition some of you may be familiar with, the Enneagram tradition. Uh, the nine personality types of the Enneagram tradition. Uh, anyway, that's uh, one of the gestalts of what it means to be a personality, that whatever personality you develop from your childhood uh, will show up in one of these nine buckets, according to this organization of personalities. Uh, and it, uh, it was discovered that all nine of these personality types are one-to-one -one related to all nine of these states of the I am, that each personality type is a means of escape from the state of being that I just described. This is a lifetime struggle to figure out what's the, what your personality is really like. Well, you can write a library of books on the states of an authentic being. You might then kind of guess as I go, which personality type most of yours? You may not know this, and, and because you can live with your personality type entirely and in very dismal ways, or you can use it creatively in very creative ways, that there's a lot of variety within each personality type. Start with number five. This is my personality type. The greed of mental aloofness. That is an escape from uh, 
a state of being on the other chart called transparent attention. So I can, as my personality type, sort of substitute for being at attention before the real deep knowing of life backed off into my mental aloofness. You get that feel of that. But that personality type is a great personality type. I mean, some of the great people like Rudolf Bultmann and A.H. Olamos are number five personalities that puts their personality to work, you know, in a good form because being a kind of intellectual nerd has its values. <laughs> but it's so easy for an intellectual nerd to back off into mental aloofness and ignore emotions and to ignore uh, the truth of demanding situations, build personal relationships at work, and things like that, you know. Let's look at uh, the lust for truth avoidance. Adolf Hitler is a good example of that one. He's a number eight personality, uh, a real leader, the furor, right? <laughs> uh, a leader. Well, number eights are leaders, or they want to be leaders. Or in any situation, they tend to take leadership, whether you give it to them or not. Uh, and they tend to be bullies. But also, Martin Luther King, I think, is a number eight personality. You can see how his taking leadership was a pretty good idea uh, in his situation for him. So uh, an eight personality can be a Martin Luther King or an Adolf Hitler and everything in between. Joe Matthews was certainly a number eight personality type. My father certainly was. Uh, and, and I was bullied, in my view, <laughs> by that particular personality. The lust for truth avoidance uh, has to do with uh, those types of people who think their truth, their little answers to things, uh, have to be forced upon everybody else. And that's kind of what leaders have to do in a particular degree anyway, right? I mean, they have to at least have things they're leading. Uh, but you can see how that can get out of hand, that that personality type can be a withdrawal from a kind of humility that the, the world is not enemies and friends. The world is just people, all of whom are challenges. Uh, that I'm not fighting a war. The war is over. There's universal forgiveness for everybody. And uh, I don't have to live my lust of bully practices. Some of you have known these number two type personalities, often codependent, often more helpful than they need to be. <laughs> Uh, more sure than they need to be that you need help and you need their help and you need it the way they want it and they expect you to help them back. Now this is a wonderful person. I mean they, these are some of the most emotionally sensitive people on earth. They know what's going on with you before you do. They're there helping you to solve your problem before you know you have a problem to solve. They are glorious in their abundant love for you and so forth uh, but uh, uh, they can be in this personality type a manipulative sureness that is beyond what's sure and, and that manipulating you may not be necessary uh, but to allow you to live your own life might be a more realistic way to live. So you get this little feel of that escape from reality. It's a great personality type. Some of the most wonderful people in our life are number two personalities but this is the flaw of escape that a number two personality might be guilty of is over manipulation with their helpfulness. Okay, number th uh, six, let's go there again, go up the middle. Uh, if you're not uh, really accessing your autonomous strength, you may be backed off into the panic of self-depreciation. I love number sixes because they're, they're, so, they're so helpful. Uh, they're uh, loyal, I mean, they're just loyal people. Uh, but the reason they're so loyal is that they need somebody to be loyal to in order to have a little bit of counter to their self-depreciation. Underneath their loyalty is uh, the temptation to not see themselves as the leadership they could be, they are, they might be, see themselves as the creative role in life they could be. They don't love this potential of themselves enough, so they're just loyal to whoever they think is kind of thing, because it, there's a panic of self-depreciation, not fully loving themselves as the state of, uh, on these other charts of 
courageous heart and autonomous strength, you see, they're denying in this flaw, uh, uh, this backing away, they're denying their autonomous strength in order to be a loyal member of, uh, of some team, which is a great gift. Then there's, there's also people like uh, uh, those who jump off of mountains who are this type of personality, I mean mountain climb and other things, do whatever is dangerous to sort of prove to themselves that they're not as afraid of life as they are. <laughs> anyway, uh, there's a complexity there of being uh, very loyal or very dangerous, uh, all out of the base of being somewhat uh, less than they could be. Then the middle one, which is a very interesting one, the sloth of spaced out peacefulness. Instead of accessing fully the enchantment of being, with being, a love of reality, or joyous stillness, uh, they're just spaced out. This is a panic almost uh, about intensity. Life is just too intense. Or it's a panic about life being as glowing and brilliant as it is. And so you back off into a kind of uh, sloth, a spiritual sloth a sloth uh, that doesn't allow life to be as intense. You can't stand conflict. This, this personality type has a real difficulty with human conflict. So he tends to be a peacemaker, a peace at any price, peace at any price uh, a type peacemaker. Uh, I mean, reconciling people, reconciling things is an important value. And people like uh, Obama, I think, are number nine personalities. Just a wonderfully sense of understanding other people's perspective, but maybe leaning a little off target into making peace at any price. Number three, uh, the vanity of public uh, celebrity is the flaw quality of personality type three, uh, who instead of accessing this outflowing compassion we talked about, they're really out there in life as a, apparently a loving person. They love to be loving in a sense, but they're out there in life as public celebrity being their primary value. Uh, attention from others, masses of people who recognize them and things, uh, maybe because of their beauty, maybe because of their success. Uh, number three is a great person to have on your team. I mean, if they are asked to do a job, they do it and they do it right. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, they're also problematical person of uh, getting in their own way uh, with uh, the need for public celebrity. Uh, one of my sons is great at this. Let's go over to number four. Uh, married a wife, a second wife like this one. The envy of ego promotion is over against primal merging uh, with your authenticity. Uh, it's like if you're really intent on being special and, you know, number four is special. It's just, it has a very special emotional awareness of life. They know what you're feeling before you feel it, almost, or before you know you're feeling it. Uh, th these people are special, in the, especially the feeling dimension. Uh, but they're hooked into their feeling wisdom over against the deeper freedom that can get beyond even their feeling wisdom in, into uh, the kind of merging with the deeper life that they are. Uh, so the, and the envy as a deadly sin of this particular personality type. Envy is anybody more special than me <laughs> is a problem in my life, you know. I need, I'm special and so I need to be more special because I'm not as special as this person is special. Uh, there's sort of a delusion there that being special is very critical to them, not realizing fully that everybody is special, just as special as me. <laughs> and that, that's a real uh, thing to take in, to merge with that kind of specialness with which everybody is special, rather than being hooked on my own brand of specialness and envious of things that I want that don't have. Number one, the wrath of moral sureness. These are the people who have specialized in eating off the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, they know how many shoes you should have on your shoe rack. 
Uh, they know how many minutes you should talk on your speech and never go over time. Uh, uh, they know everything is right and everything is wrong, and they know what's right and what's wrong. Uh, this is the, the wrath of moral sureness. And it's wrath because they're angry at life. They're angry because you don't live by their values. And they let you know it, and you feel it. that, that uh, When they're angry with you because you're not doing what they think you should be doing, there you, you know it. Uh, so this kind of pickiness is also a great gift because here's another personality type that's good to have on your team because they get it done. They get it done right. <laughs> Especially they get it done right, what they think is right. But sometimes their right is wrong, and so that's the problem. But instead of accessing their interior purity of freedom, they're backed away into moral sureness. Uh, that's the, the basic structure of personality type one. And finally, personality type seven, instead of attuned working, they have a gluttony for endless novelty. Maybe you know people who are great at all kinds of things. That they're just, well, uh, I think Albert Schweitzer was a personality type seven. He was a great pianist, a great New Testament scholar, and learned to be a great doctor and missionary to Africa. You wonder if there's anything this guy couldn't do well. Of course, not all number sevens do everything they do well, but you, you've, you've met people who are perhaps over, more scattered in life than they might be. They lack focus. Uh, they lack uh, uh, completion. For a lot of times, these people are leery of completing anything they're scattered into. And they're a hard person to have in your religious circle because they're enthusiastic, 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 and then they're gone. Because they're off in something else, and then something else, and something else, and something else, and then something else. And they come back and with you a little while, and they're off again, something else. I mean, this is a troublesome person, and yet they're such a delightful person. Uh, they just will open to anything for a while. We don't live our freedom and our trust and our compassion that is present in the depths of this life. Instead, we live inside a little box. Instead of living this whole relationship to the final reality, we live inside this box. This box protects us from our gross humanity and protects us from the final mystery both. This box has a name. It's called personality. Each of us live in this box of personality. Typically, we don't know we're in a box. We think the box is us. Uh, we think the box contains reality. And we need to understand that each of us has constructed this box. It's human made, board by board since infancy. This box of well-practiced set of habits is a useful. Uh, you wouldn't want to be without your box. <laughs> you wouldn't want to be without your well-practiced habits. Uh, they do have some utility. Uh, sometimes we call this box our, our social conditioning because what makes up our personality is not unique to us. Uh, we've learned it from our society in most cases. We've not created something society never heard of before. Uh, society is also a box, a set of habits that have become customary for those of us who live in that society. But our habits are not our true being. Our customs are not our true being. Our moralities are not our true being. Our beliefs are not our true being. Our personality is not our true being. Our personality habits are also past-oriented. This is the way we always did things, but it ain't necessarily the way we always will do things or could do things. We learned these habits in the past. We put this personality together over the course of our lives. But we do not live in the past, actually. We live now and only now, and it's always nothing but now. And the real person lives in this now and is capable of breaking these habits and doing something different. We built this pattern with our essential freedom. And once the box was built to exclude our freedom, we became a robot of these patterns that function unconsciously, automatically, our personality patterns tend to be inflexible. They do not apply to all the situations that come up in life. So they're kind of like a block of ice that won't move through some of the narrow places in life. You know, they kind of move along pretty good a lot of the time, but then you come to one of these narrow places in life, 
and your block of ice just won't go through there. But the same water, when melted, will flow through anything. Any spot in the stream, no matter how tough, no matter how narrow, your true essence, your true freedom, your true spontaneity, your true creativity will flow fine in that spot. Our true being is flowing water. I learned something from Buddhism that's been very useful to me. Uh, that meditation is a practice and that religion, is, what, what religion is, is a practice. It's something you do. Somebody asked their meditation, Buddhist meditation teacher, <clears throat> whether the practice of meditation caused enlightenment. And the teacher said, no, enlightenment is an accident. <laughs> but meditation makes you more accident prone. <laughs> Which was very much rem reminiscent of the Tillich paper that made it clear that grace was a happening that happened or didn't happen. That's a clue, I think, as to what religion is. Uh, religion is a practice that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Uh, when I was pastor of a local church, <clears throat> I gave sermons uh, that some days people left out the back door just glowing with new enthusiasm or something, you know. And there were other days when I gave sermons and they just felt like dead lead on the, uh, sometimes the magic works, sometimes it doesn't, you know. You never know whether your religious practice is going to bring about a, a new kind of experience of profound humanness or whether it's just going to be religious practice that just didn't work that day, either for you weren't ready for it or the practice to become obsolete or you don't know probably what happened, but at any rate, that's the nature of religion. Its purpose is to help you access your profound humanness, if it's a good religion. Uh, but accessing profound humanness is always a grace happening, an accident uh, that you cannot control or predict with your religion. That's very important. It reminds me of the closing scenes of the little big man movie where the old Indian chief goes to the top of the mountain to build, do his death ritual. It's time for him to die. So he goes up to the top of the mountain with a little big man accompanying him. <coughs> he lays out and goes through all of his uh, Native American rituals, uh, expecting his soul to be taken off. Uh, but it doesn't happen. It just starts drizzling on him. And uh, finally he gets up and says, sometimes the magic works and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> and they go back down the hill uh, to, to live a while longer. <laughs> well, that's, that's an insight in religion I have not forgotten. This chart is a chart related to the other two charts. We, we studied this in the last session that associates a religious practice, a type of religious practice, with each of these uh, states of consciousness or states of, of all. For example, the profound dialogue practice relates to helping you access your, your transparent attention, your beyond knowing, your interior uh, watching. Uh, what the practice of profound dialogue amounts to is recognizing that you have inside your being all the great minds, all the great persons in your life, maybe your parent, maybe your teachers, uh, maybe the people you've read, that, that this reside there as a counsel of advice, reside there as people who speak to you about your life issues. So everybody has this interior counsel. And the practice is to take charge of that counsel, to recognize these are valuable voices, all the great people that have addressed your life in some way or another, exemplified it, gave you ways of living, showed you things. Uh, to take charge of your counsel means to decide who are the most important ones for people to listen to. <laughs> Put them on the front row of your counsel. Uh, maybe you organize your counsel by types of uh, people and types of subject matter that you have one counsel for this, one counsel for this, one counsel for that. Uh, but the discipline is to realize that not only do you listen to these great voices in, that you've acquired in your lifetime, 
But also you can speak back. Uh, you can argue with them. You can dismiss them from your counsel entirely if they become voices you no longer need to hear. Uh, so this is, a, this is the practice, is to recognize that interior counsel and, and construct your dialogue with it. And that's a lot of what we do when we do meditative readings and, and dialogue with the scriptures and, and read the great theologians and, and do things of that nature. So it's inner dialogue with Paul Tillich and, and Rudolf Bultmann and A.H. Almas and Martin Luther and <laughs> Jesus and the Buddha and whoever's on your inner council of persons that have uh, already in interfered with your life. Foundational meditation is about uh, the kind of thing we did in the early s sessions of really being conscious of our consciousness. Uh, so whether it's uh, meditating, as the Buddhists tend to meditate with concentration on the breath, concentration on your being a powerful, noticing person. One of the great gifts of meditation, uh, as the Buddhists pioneered it, was to access that courageous heart, that autonomous strength, uh, uh, that love of self, that invincible. Uh, so though there's a certain association between uh, that autonomous strength and the practice of meditation, a foundational meditation. <clears throat> then persistent intentions uh, helps you access your profound merging, your freedom, your basic freedom. Uh, we've, in the Christian faith, called that prayer. Uh, and it's very helpful to understand what prayer is as persistent intentions. Uh, Christianity created four different types of prayer, or recognized four different types of prayer, confession, Gratitude, petition, and intercession. Confessionary prayer means the intention of owning up to what's going on in your life. Owning up to uh, ways you've failed to live, and ways you've lived that's made sense and need to be pursued. Uh, confession, owning up. Gratitude is the kind of intention that has to do with acknowledgement of the goodness of life itself. Uh, both in its great pleasurable and wonder-filling experiences, but even the experiences you wouldn't have asked for for the world, uh, still a, a deep sense of gratitude is being able to take in those uh, horrifying and, and demanding kinds of moments uh, with a, a deeper type or at least another type of, of gratitude. So that the intention of being grateful in spite of all comers is a practice of this uh, persistent intentions. And petitions means really asking for what you want, asking what you believe you need. Uh, it's being aggressive about getting for yourself what you really do feel would be fulfilling. Uh, so don't feel uncomfortable asking. To, to acknowledge what you want and ask for it uh, is a, doesn't mean you're going to get it, <laughs> but, to, but to ask. Uh, to aggressively go for, uh, imaginally, puts you in the space of being ready for it when it comes, if it comes. Uh, so it's a powerful thing to be persistently uh, uh, acknowledging what you want for your life, what you want for uh, yourself and becoming your best self and so on. So prayer of the petitionary sort is a very helpful practice and may have the accident of bringing you into places you wouldn't have been gone without it. And intercession is, is applying that same kind of principle to other people. Uh, people who are important to you, uh, ask, ask, ask for what they need. Uh, this is not going to magically bring it. Uh, you're not going to magically convert your most horrifying enemies by praying for uh, their conversion or whatever. Uh, but it will put you in a place where you have opportunities to speak to that person or do something with that person, uh, it puts you in a place of readiness to be the person they need uh, in your relationships to them. Uh, and no matter who you're praying for, it puts you in a position of being ready for anybody. Uh, if you're praying for the planet, uh, we'll learn how to take care of it. 
It puts you in the position to vote the way you need to vote when you come to time to vote or whatever else happens to you. So this persistent intentions is accessing your profound freedom in the best case scenario. It may not work, but sometimes the magic works that uh, a prayer life brings you in touch with your freedom and with the ability to be interiorly initiative uh, in the midst of things that are going to happen to you. So people who practice uh, ongoing powerful prayer life or what you might say, programming their interior computer to be ready for opportunities to be that freedom that you're practicing. So you kind of get the association there. Now on the top, this has more to do with being with other people, kind of practice you, you do together more than alone. Those three practices are, are more lonely, uh, singular, uh, solitary practices. But the next three, the top three, are more practices of group practice. For example, the holistic detachment well, it has a lot to do with joining a religious order or something of that nature or, or getting simplified living uh, structured for yourself in such a way that, that your fo focus has become primary. That was the, the advantage of having religious orders, I think, was that really focused your vocational contribution. It really puts you in a place of being able to do what the general society could not do because it was too locked into all the patterns of the general society. So to pull out of that general society, create an order of mission that got things done that weren't normally done was a great gift to, to civilization. But it's a great lift to uh, realize just plain simple fact that economic pros pros prosperity is not the only game going. Uh, Becoming a successful human being is a deeper and more important game that it makes you happy with or without uh, ideal prosperity. It's not anything to do with a depreciation of prosperity or the need for e economic well-being, but it's getting things straight. So the practice of simplicity living, the practice of holistic detachment, as it's called here, uh, is a corporate practice uh, that's been very useful in the history of mankind. Devotional singularity is a practice relating to uh, outflowing compassion. It has to do with a cultural discipline. All of us have that opportunity to, with some practice designed by a larger group of people, to be devotional. Uh, I think that's the, the purpose, in my view, of organizing circles of, of uh, intimacy is uh, to practice caring for one another and practice being a team care for the parish or region of humanity in which you live. Uh, just that practice of being ready to do things together that need to be done, that practice of caring for each other in very mundane but very spiritual also ways. Uh, this is the practice of just setting aside one day a week, by God, I'm going to meet with this group of people and we're going to take care of each other. That is a deep, wonderful practice uh, that has long-range complications on your life, <laughs> long-range gifts to your life in the area of outflowing compassion. Uh, to be outflowing compassion by practice with uh, nine people uh, prepares you to be outflowing compassion with the planet as, as, as a whole. Uh, then historical engagement. This may not seem like a religious practice, but the illustration that convinced me it is, is walking the streets of Jackson, Mississippi uh, with Martin Luther King. Uh, I had the opportunity back in those days to be an active part of the civil rights movement. And one of those active parts was walking down those Jackson streets, which were, you know, policed by racial bigots <laughs> of the highest order. <laughs> And those, oh, you looked at, at the danger of it. Of course, there was a lot of people. There was actually no danger to me, really, but uh, I felt the power of it anyway. And you pass those people on the streets, uh, some sitting on their porches, uh, hating you, and others cheering you on uh, as you walk down their street. Uh, that, to me, was a religious practice. Uh, it was accident-prone, <laughs> making me accident-prone to be uh, 
a, a different human being, to take more seriously a tune working in the times in which I lived, uh, working beyond fate with the possibility of revolutionizing my society, uh, obedient uh, liberation, uh, intentionality. Anyway, those kind of practices are options that the human community has invented to help us on our journey. These next two are, are a little more profound in some ways, the next three, I mean, the ones across the middle. Let's look first at boundless inquiry. How many of you have kept a journal at one time in your life? Uh -huh. A diary or a journal, either one, okay. Well, that's a practice of boundless inquiry. I mean, what you're doing, you're writing down things that have to do with your life and reflecting on them more fully. Uh, and there's no question of what taking a journal uh, can be a very helpful and making you accident prone to access your history and future and present uh, more, more fully. And if you're meditating on all kinds of people, as you often do in your journal, your relationship to them or, or your concern for them and, or sometimes an analysis of them, <laughs> whatever you're writing down, uh, you're, you're probably helping yourself uh, to live beyond desperation into a kind of forgiveness or acceptance of yourself and others uh, as they appear uh, in your specific life. Uh, so I've put this boundless inquiry practice in relationship to uh, that particular state of being. It's true that all these practices relate to all these states of beings, but uh, in this chart, it's, I kind of see these associations. Or, or what I'm really seeing, I think, is that the humanity has invented religious practices that help you with each one of these various uh, aspects of our pr profound humanness. Then let's look over here at a full-bodied exclamation. Now that's a new one for me. Uh, Joyce and I had the privilege of making some real contact with a woman who organized a uh, practice called inter interplay, interplay, uh, helping us what she called X form to make up for all the inform. She grasped the fact that we are overloaded with information and need to do some X formation. We need to get our, what we do know, out there in, in a practice that uh, uh, helps us be outgoing as well as ingoing. So instead of information, uh, she wants us to do full-bodied exclamation. She was a dancer who also became a Methodist preacher. And uh, in that role, she tried to use some of her dance experience to dance religion in her congregation. They didn't like it. Uh, they literally uh, felt her, felt like the, this profession of clergyman was not what she wanted. So she and a, another man, a very creative man, not her married partner, but her business partner, organized this movement, uh, Interplay. If you ever hear of an Interplay meeting, you might be joy to go to it. Down in the very middle there uh, is, I had to put down here at the bottom, the practice of visionary trance. You see that down there at the bottom? That's talking about a practice of religion that relates to the enchantment with being or love of reality as a whole. And this is a hard one to, uh, to communicate because it's the most weird sounding to, to modern people like us. But it wasn't weird in the history of humanity. The shaman of ancient, ancient times took people on quests, on vision tribes, on vision journeys. Uh, like they went out of their minds. Sometimes they used drugs to get there. Uh, some of them used intentional drumming until you just, or dancing, until you just went someplace, you know, into another space uh, and came back again. Uh, or this appeared in the Holy Rollers uh, and Shakers and Quakers of Christian tradition uh, that you just found this out of your mind, the states that, that came into being as a practice, which uh, allowed you to get out of your mind, basically, <laughs> into uh, something deeper. Uh, and not just be, yeah, locked into uh, blinders with life. There are things you do probably have done, uh, if these sound a little weird, uh, that are also uh, visionary trance practices, like laughter. Sometimes just having a laugh face, face and there's, there is a practice where 
you lay on each other's stomachs and go haw haw and haw haw until finally everybody is haw hawing so that it's just an outlandish outside your mind experience of just being in a laughter fest. Probably some of you have done something like this. Or a song fest. Also sometimes do this. You have to be sung about the third Negro spiritual, black spiritual, uh, or you might go someplace, you know, and into a genuine uh, musical trance uh, and come back again to your life uh, and, and more accident prone for enchantment with being. <laughs> you get that feeling. Another thing is, is chants. Some of these ancient Hindu chants uh, were just unbelievably uh, trance uh, performing. Just a religious retreat can be a kind of visionary trance experience as a whole, because you get away from life for three days, four days, five days, six days. When you go back, you know you've been somewhere. There's an re-entry re -entry problem. <laughs> Sometimes good retreat leaders prepare you for re-entry, making it clear to you, you, you've been in trance space here for six days. You're going home again to the same old stuff you were, but you're not the same person you were, and you should expect uh, some re-entry quick struggle as you leave the retreat and go back to your normal life. So all those are illustrations of the practice of uh, visionary trance, is that religion is a practice. It is something you do. Now there's theoretics and thinking that goes along with these practices, but basically you do religion. It's, it's not that you just think new thoughts. You do something. Uh, you practice something. Uh, you, the intellectual part is, informs and is part of the practice, but it's not the essence of religion. To have a philosophy of life is not the essence of religion. The essence of religion is to practice, 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 practice. Every week, every day, you know, you do something. Every year you do something. It's, it's a practice. That's a revolution for me to get that really clear. Uh, and the practice doesn't always work. Uh, you come to three Sunday night meetings of your little circle, and you haven't gone to heaven yet, you just give up. But you gave up too soon because the fourth and fifth was heavenly trip. Uh, it just, sometimes the magic works, sometimes it doesn't. So we have to keep at this practice until the intent of the practice does its job, or does you, or whatever it needs to do to make the, uh, what you're after happen. Uh, so that's a very important uh, understanding of religion. This is an interreligious age, and we're learning from each other whether we want to or not. It's just every great city on the earth has almost every practice of religion going on in it. Uh, and if we can't respect ourselves, or, or humanity, across those barriers, uh, well, we are in trouble. Uh, and we, we need our Buddhist colleagues and our Hindu colleagues and our Islam great Islamic colleagues to solve the problems of religion in the world and to filter up into the social patterns the kind of profound humanists we're trying to access here. We know that Gandhi was not a Christian. He may have learned something from Christianity, but he was, he was a Hindu. Malcolm X was a wise figure who was a Muslim. We have to have this feel in our organizing or reorganizing our Christianity, if we're going to be Christians, or our Buddhism, or our Hinduism, whatever you're organizing, if you're going to organize or reorganize some religion. And this, for me, is a basic series of insights for this interreligious age, that we find our way to understand that all these religions, in their great form, are talking about many of the same things uh, that we can access in our own lives. Uh, and that's the key to the dialogue. When you get on a subject, general subject like awe and profound humanness, uh, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, Judaism, are all accessing that in some ways. Now, Christians might access some things a little bit better, and Hindus might access other things a little bit better, and we learn from each other in this interreligious world. We're, we're wor er working in the 20th century out of different master metaphors than they had to work with in the first century. So translating the Bible out of the primitive ancient 
metaphorical use of the Bible into metaphors that are speaking to us today is a big problem with the theoretics of Christianity. And every religion has something like this in its theoretics. The word spirit is a problem word. And so partly we have a semantic problem here. When I use the word spirit, I mean profound humanness. So what we did this morning on accessing on the profound human we have to access, that is our, our love, our, our freedom, our overcoming of despair with trust, all that has to do with our profound humanness. So if you have a spirituality, as you call it, that helps you access profound humanness, right? You might, if you have a practice of some kind of whatever you call spirituality that helps you access profound humanness, then you have what I mean by religion. It may not have a, folk, a name like Christian or Buddhist or something, but spirituality and religion are a name for the same thing. A lot of what people call spirituality is a rather self-constructed sentimentality or is a, or is a new age fabrication of self-love and things like this. So I'm a little leery of the word spirituality because it's not grounded very well for many people in daily solitary practice. Every week getting together with members of your practice. Every year going to a retreat that has to do with your life. You know, something like that. Practice uh, is the key to religion and spirituality. Both. Uh, if it's a genuine spirituality, it's helping you access your profound humanness. Uh, now, Understandable. A lot of people have avoided the word religion because the religions that they have experienced, both sick Buddhism and sick Christianity and sick Judaism and sick Islam, uh, they don't want to hear the word religion ever again. <laughs> so they want to use the word spirituality for good religion, which is valid for their, but we have to ask them what they mean. And if spirituality means for you, you want a good religion instead of these sick ones, uh, but you're actually dealing with the same issues. Do you create a spirituality based on Christian heritage, Buddhist heritage, no heritage at all, but some new heritage? You're creating religion or spirituality that serves you and your, your, your colleagues and friends. But basic metaphor or primal metaphor, what, this, what that word is saying is that in the West, we had different primal metaphors for our religious creation. And in the East, they had other primal metaphors for the religious creation. And this little chart is trying to say what those primal metaphors are like. Uh, so in the West, which uh, this, is, this is the Arabian, Arabian West, which incorporated itself with the Athenian Greek heritage. These religions all began as Arabian experiences, which accessed Greek culture to enrich themselves with. So in the West, we really have a blend of the ancient Hebraic, Jerusalem, Arabic heritage with the, the Greek heritage of Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and so forth. So that's the West, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. And the East is primary, or in terms of the, the great religions, the most expansive religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, which uh, lives out of, for many, for, for all Hindus, basically, and and many Buddhists out of the Indus River area of India. And then Buddhism went into the Orient, into China and Japan and other places. Uh, so Buddhism has its Oriental forms and its India forms that are quite different. But all of them have this basic, all forms of Buddhism and Hinduism have this basic Ur image operating. Uh, except the Orient has, I won't go into the Orient, but I'm basically talking about India here, <laughs> ancient India up into the present time, is functioning out of these kind of terms and their meaning, while we in the West are functioning out of the left side of the chart and their meaning. So let me look at, first of all, just what Buddhism and Hinduism, uh, and I'll start with Hindu terms, are doing. They're basically saying with the term Atman, what we're saying with great self or profound humanness uh, or in Buddhism, no self. So the Atman is the great self, the true self. And Brahman 
means the uh, mysterious wholeness of being, which are familiar topics for Christianity, but they are looking at them differently. And that great saying out of Hinduism, that I am uh, holds together for Hindu lore something very basic. They're saying that overwhelming up againstness, up against which I'm up against, the wholeness of being, I am. I'm part of that. I'm finding my unity with that is uh, what enlightenment or nirvana uh, means. Uh, to find oneness, to find identity uh, in this Atman level of, of life, the real I. Uh, Hinduism and Buddhism tend to be solitary religions and meditation, at least for Buddhism, tends to be the basic religious practice. So you get a certain feel of what that Ur is like. It's focused on consciousness and the becoming at one with the wholeness. Uh, while the Arabian image on the left-hand side is concerned with dialogue. Uh, there's the I-thou dialogue between human beings, uh, goes back and forth. Uh, intimacy, that is sharing the communication uh, of your soul, of your mind, of your body, of your this is a primary metaphorical feel for the Arabian Ur, or the Arabian primal metaphor. And then we is an important category. The people of Israel, the kingdom of God, the body of Christ, these are all terms that have to do with being a community of people. And we, in history, relate to the thou that's facing us in every historical event. So this we, thou, being the people of God who respond to God, uh, being the kingdom of God on earth, uh, responding in obedience to God, this we, thou, uh, when there's another kind of intimacy metaphor, is very basic to those three great religions. Time and history are very basic. And so far, thinking together as Christian renewal experts, we create this little wedge blade which has to do with the fact that the great thou is being responded to by the people on the front edge of that wedge uh, and on behalf of leading all the people in the wedge of humanity toward adequate response to the great thou. Something like how history is providing us with the demand to do something about our climate. That's, that's out there. It's not something inside me. It's a encounter I'm having with a demand to save the planet from global warming or from poverty or from aristocratic uh, arrogance or whatever is happening in my history. So this is one of the great parts of Judaism and Christianity is understanding there is this out there reality that those traditions tend to call the almighty. The almighty that is encountered in every historical event. So if the Assyrians are attacking Jerusalem, uh, that's God <laughs> sending the, the Assyrian conquerors to beat the shit out of this uh, society who is off, off target and dealing with the reality of being conquered by the Assyrians is the awesome response that we need to make to the awesome. So that's what we mean by the, the first person of Christian Trinity is that up against this, up against which you're up against, when you're up against, you're really up against it. Uh, that we we're out to have people realize that they're limited as well as put in life. You're put in life and you're limited in life, and both being put and being limited is an experience of the up againstness that's called the Father or the Almighty in this heritage. The Holy Spirit then refers to this profound humanness that is spelled out for me with the concept of awe. The awe of trust, the awe of freedom, the awe of love. These qualities are being awed by the awesome. The we are the odd ones, the ones that are awed by the awesome. So this spirit of that tradition 
means uh, accessing that experience of being awed by what's out there, the finally awesome or mysterious up against this, up against which I'm up against. Uh, so those are ways of coming at that problem. I don't mean out there to mean some religious doctrinal group who's cramming their stuff down my throat. Uh, I mean the reality that all of us are up against, whether we want to be or not. This, this one, one reality here, uh, a very mysterious one <laughs> that is confronting us. Yeah, you, you, God is a kind of a code word that means different things to different people. It also means devotion to. Uh, so everybody has a God in the sense that you're devoted to something. Uh, so it, it is kind of important to define what you're devoted to. So I'm using the word reality to help me. Also the awesome and the mysterious land <laughs> I'm having to live in as a, other words to, to talk about the God that is my God or my devotion. So all, all that has to be sorted out. Yes, uh, there, this mysterious no, I'm up against, this Brahman that runs the universe, I am. Which means to me that the all and the awesome are inseparable. If I'm awed, I'm awed by the awesome. If I'm encountering the final Brahman, I'm participating in the Atman. That that's the insight out of which that tradition was built. Uh, but it's very solitary and it doesn't take history and time as seriously as I'd like to take it in, in my tradition. See, in my tradition, it's not a Atman all oneness, but it's a historical encounter with a demand for justice. <laughs> Well, the, the Brahman is symbolic for the exterior, that, you see, the that, not me, that. But, that. but that I am means that you face an elephant face charging you, that elephant, I am. Uh -huh. So it, it is a real encounter they're speaking of with really, the Brahman is a, a, a pointing category out that way. This elephant is coming at me, but elephanthood is part of who I am, so I'm not facing something alien here. I'm just facing my awesome world awing me. <laughs> well, what I'm saying is both of these metaphors are valid. They help us access our profound humanness, and both of them are finite metaphors. They have limitations. Uh, the Eastern metaphor has some limitations relative to communal life and justice, in my view. And the Western metaphor has some limitations about really getting serious about the radicality of your interior being. So the contemplative gifts of the East are very valuable to we Westerners. We have to have both, have both are dynamic. I do not foresee, however, the world becoming all one religion. We're gonna always have a great variety of religious practices. But in an interreligious world, we Christians need to learn from the Buddhists. And the Buddhists need to learn from the Christians. I mean, the Christians that are really getting hold of their Christianity. Uh, because this is the world we live in. We have to be, we can't have a whole continent of Christians. There is no such thing anymore. And we can't have a whole continent of Buddhists. There is no such thing anymore. Uh, so we are going to be an interreligious world with a great variety of religious practices. But all those practices to be good are helping us access something universal about being human. Now, now that's a very controversial insight. Let me tell you a little story though. I was in Australia teaching a eight week program for people that had six uh, Aborigine people in this program. And I never encountered a culture more different from my own than I encountered in this Australian Aborigine. I mean, they were isolated for thousands of years without any agriculture, without any uh, civilization at all, just tribal life over 12 or 15 or 20,000 years old and older, you see. And this culture just mystified me. Uh, but these people participated in the course. I didn't know what they were saying about half the time. But when I caught on what they were saying, 
they were telling me a story that was a better answer to the question I asked for grounding than some of my white Australian friends, you know, who were more rational, but just didn't have that mystical something or other that the Aborigine members of this course had. And one morning, I'd given a lecture on uh, the, the land of mystery. And after that lecture, this tall, thin Aborigine man, as black as that statue, uh, comes up to me and says to me this line, which I have never forgotten. When you talk like that, I hear you in my own stories. My own stories. I don't know what the hell his stories were. I probably wouldn't have understood them if they just told me. But he recognized that what I was talking about, he was talking about with his stories, and that we were members of the same humanity. That's what I mean. These cultural barriers are very real, very difficult to overcome, but they are overcomable. Uh, we are a same species. We have the same bodily, mental, physical, spiritual essentials, and we can communicate with each other uh, if it's done well enough. So that's, a, to me, a living story that holds my view intact <laughs> that uh, behind all of our differences, we are one humanity. And that's what I mean by profound humanness. There's so much bad religion out there that is really not intending to help us with our profound humanness, but is intending to help us with uh, escaping from our profound humanness into some kind of uh, comforting foolishness. Uh, and uh, that kind of religion is a perversion. But it doesn't mean because there's so many perversions of religion out there that religion is not an important part of human life. I mean, you, you wouldn't give up economics just because you got poor economics, would you? I mean, you know, we, we've got to have economics. We've got to access resources and produce them into something useful and distribute the useful things of services and goods. Uh, that's an essential part of society. Well, religion is just like that. It's an essential part of society. So it's important to have good religion that helps you access your profound humanness rather than the bad religion we have that helps you escape your profound humanness. Uh, so reforming religion or making a new religion that uh, does the job uh, of helping people be more accident prone to their humanness is a very important thing. And so it's, it's worth your life, if you want it to be worth your life, to give your time to practicing, not only for yourself, but building practices that work for other people and reforming uh, the obsolete practices that uh, characterize our planet. Uh, so if anybody wants a religious vocation, there's, it's just as honorable uh, as uh, becoming a lawyer uh, or a physician or a nurse or a teacher or anything else. Today is just that religious formation is the basic pole of culture, which is the being pole of society, which is always going on for humans who are very social beings. Uh, now that's a controversial topic for some people. Uh, Marx wanted to make economics the, the foundational thing. But for me, believe it or not, religion is the foundational thing. It's at the bottom of it all. It gives meaning to the whole cultural realm, and the whole cultural realm gives meaning to the economic realm and the political realm. And so the revolution in religion is primary to making society change, because everything that happens in religion affects every other process in society uh, one way or the other. Very bad religion helps filter up into a very bad society, and very good religion opens up all kinds of possibilities for a very good society. Religion always manifests in some kind of ethics, which is intentionalizing the fact that religion influences everything. Out of your access of your profound humanness, everything changes. Your view of, of economics, and your view of politics, and your view of cultural building, education, everything shifts uh, when you're operating out of your profound humanness rather than out of your illusions. Uh, so this is figuring out your ethics uh, from that basis 
is a part of the theoretics of a religion. Well, this brings me to the next paradox that we need to understand to rebuild religion. And that is that the rebuilding religion starts with accessing a profound humanness and giving form to it. Uh, now, the forms you give to it are never going to hold it, but you have to give form to it in order to, in order to practice it, in order to have it, in order to continue living it. So the, uh, the institutionalization of what we point to with accessing profound humanness takes place. The religion doesn't just include having top drawer experiences. It includes giving those top drawer experiences a whole organization, uh, a religious organization, an institutionalization, if you like. Now, in our day, institutionalizing is offensive to people. It's offensive to us because we've met so many institutions that were not, not functioning well. But if you don't have economic institutions, you don't have an economy. These essential economic processes are just there in the universal structure of society, but they have to be institutionalized. And this society institutionalizes one way, and this society institutionalizes another way, but without institutions, you don't carry out the, the primal function. This is true of religion. The primal function is to access your profound humanness, but this cannot be done without institutions. And that's very offensive to you and you and you and you and you and me. <laughs> because we don't have a positive view of institutions. We hate institutions. We hate them because we've had so many bad ones that have injured us. But the English language is an institution. What would we do without it? It's an institution. That's what we mean by institution, is something that works for us. Communication is the, is the need, but you have to have a language if you're gonna to talk to each other. So the language or structure of English can, or some other language is an institution, and art is all an institution. Uh, art is a big business for paintings, and a big business for music, and a big business for so and so and so and so. Architecture takes tremendous institutionalizations to build great cathedrals or tall buildings or whatever architecture of great energy you're going to create. So without institutionalization, none of these essential social processes are actually carried out in history. So. You're just thinking, you're not doing without building institutions. If you're gonna do something, you have to build an institution that does it. Now that's an unfriendly insight to many people because they wanna live in their minds and not in history. Uh, if you're gonna live in history, you're gonna build institutions or correct the institutions you've got uh, in some way or another, or you're just playing games, you see. So that's, that's, that's an insight we have to grasp to ever be interested in renewing our religions or in creating a new religion that we like better. We, we're not gonna have a new religion without institutionalizing it. The reason why institutionalization is an important idea to figure out what word you use for it is that you think about Islam. Islam institutionalized after the Muhammad heartfelt revolution struck fire in lots of people what do we do? We bow five times a day to, toward Mecca uh, to remind ourselves that there's just one God. <laughs> we just do that. So here you have this movement through generations of history because it was institutionalized. Uh, and we have Christianity because it was institutionalized. If, I mean, Jesus institutionalized a little bit and Paul institutionalized God much more. By the time you get to Augustine, you're doing civilization-wide institutionalization with the political system and the king and the rich people giving money to the institutionalization further to take this message to the last village of the world. <laughs> when we sent these nuns and monks and priests out there to bring the gospel to people who had never heard it and so forth. So an entire civilization was in some measure healed as well as perverted and later so into various kinds of problems. But this was always reformed. This monastery came into being to reform Christianity. Luther tore down half of the Christian heritage at that time, the popes and six, five of the seven sacraments and so forth, and built a new Christianity. 
and their institutionalization, which we call Protestantism. This is what the history of religion is like and going to be like always. Uh, there's always this tension between the, the spiritual access of our profound humanness and giving it some kind of form, giving it some kind of social movement, some kind of social history, some kind of permanence in life that can pass on my little discovery, profound humanness, to thousands and thousands of other people through generations and generations and generations and generations. Uh, so we're just talking revolution here. And whether you're talking about race or feminism or Christian religion, you're going to face this paradox, this tension between finding the depth of it in your own soul and then trying to give it form, knowing that the forms you give it are never going to do the job and they're going to pervert and they're going to have to be reformed. Uh, and that's sort of anguishing, but uh, that's the way it is. That's the way it's always going to be. Uh, and so we need to get busy, in my view, <laughs> and build some new institutions for Christianity, if that's our love, or build some new institutions for Buddhism, if that's our love, or if a new religion is needed, you're gonna have to build institutions for it. That's the thing I wanna talk about, the idea of creating religion, or recreating religion. And uh, this is an old thing, the second in Christianity. Jesus created, I mean, he was a creative Jew. He was an utterly loyal Jew. But he was very creative in bringing the, the radicality in Judaism up to date in his particular Galilean communities. And Paul, Paul did a revolution on that, expanding religion out into the Mediterranean world, taking Gentiles who were hanging on to the edge of the uh, synagogues into the mix, which was really trouble for the Jews that were already in the mix, uh, who thought they ought to be circumcised, as you remember, and, and Paul just stood by, no, uh, the Holy Spirit is interviewing, entering uncircumcised people just as men as well as circumcised ones, and we will require that. And they had a, almost a war over that. At any rate, this revolution in religion has been there from the beginning, and Augustine and Christianity, and Thomas Aquinas and Christianity, and Luther and Christianity, and my favorite man, Kierkegaard and Christianity, all were religious revolutionaries in the Christian context. And this story can be told in Buddhism, Hinduism. Buddhism is a strange, strange, strange religion. It has gone everywhere, and everywhere it's gone, it just sort of absorbed the culture it went into and created a new Buddhism. Uh, it's, it's as evangelistic as Christianity. Uh, those two religions have just, just spread like fever from the very beginning and have spread into every culture on the planet. You're going to do something by organizing something to make that teaching possible, and that is going to bring you into this paradox that whatever name you give it, institutions are a part of human life from which there is no escape. And religion is the process of religion is in no different from the process of sewage disposal. If you want sewage disposed, you have to create an institution for it. If you want profound humanness to be accessed by the majority or abundance of people, you're going to have to organize something to get that done. And the organization is already there going on, so it may be that simply reforming organizations you already have is a better option in some cases. I think right now, I'm not interested in reforming the Methodist Church anymore. I don't think the Methodist Church can be reformed. I think it's too sick to be informed. I think the spirituality I'm trying to share with you this morning is not going to fit into the old wineskin of Methodism. I'm having to build a new expression of Christianity that is very different from Methodism <laughs> in order to express my experience of profound humanness adequately or more adequately, recognizing what I'm going to build with my little circles and, and they're meeting together and they're studying Kierkegaard or whatever they do um, is not the final answer because there are no final answers in historical life. But that has to be done in some manner by somebody. If 
20 years from now, 100 years from now, 200 years from now, somebody's going to remember Jesus and his revolution in, in accessing profound humanness. Uh, we wouldn't even know of him if it hadn't been institutionalized and passed on down to us. The United States of America is a great institutionalization. I mean, the, the original ideas of the, the equality of all the people and the right to get more people voting and so forth and making the great common decisions was a deeply revolutionary thing uh, that set aside the king. Even though we have kingly presidents, we set aside the king. And even though we didn't let women and black people vote for a while, uh, we were starting a revolution. Uh, but now that United States revolution has beginning to drop through the donut, in my view, in terms of its foreign relations and its internal care for the poor, and you could name 16 other things. Uh, and so we have to repair or re reinstitutionalize the United States of America into forms of better justice than we have. And this is what you read about in the Bible, isn't it? When Amos comes upon the scene, he's radically out to reinstitutionalize the whole of Israel. And so was Isaiah and 2nd Isaiah and 3rd Isaiah and 14th Isaiah. They were all out to revolutionize uh, the people of God to get them back to what it was like to leave bondage and be free. And, and this is the whole story. Jesus was a similar kind of thing. He was a Jew to the end of his days, but he appointed 12, or maybe he didn't, but they thought he did. At any rate, they had 12, representing the 12 tribes of Israel, who were going to institutionalize a whole new Judaism uh, with new tribes, new understandings, new life. And Paul picked up that and did some more things with it and so on and so on down to us.